We've covered quite a bit of ground already, and we're going to pick up today at the point that there are some misconceptions about marriage that we need to correct. Let me say one other thing also. I will, at the end of this, I will make the outline available to you. I may not print it off, but I'll, at least I can give you a PDF copy, and you can print it off yourselves in case you want to keep it. Um, and that'll give you all the verses. And so, you know, if you miss something along the way, don't worry, I'll have, the, uh, I'll have that for you. Um, some of the misconceptions that we have to consider, and, and any time we deal with this, people will take it sometimes so literally that they misunderstand what it is that I'm trying to say. So please watch as we go through this, because you, this is one of those areas where you can land way over here on this side, you can land way over here on this side, but we need to be like with all things, moderation, you need to have this somewhere in the middle, okay? On one side you will have people that will say that attractiveness or chemistry or physical connection is absolutely not necessary relative to marriage, um, that if both parties follow the Word of God, it doesn't matter if there's any kind of a relationship other than that that the marriage will work. In a perfect world that's probably correct, but we don't live in a perfect world. And it's hard enough to get through this when there is some sort of an attractiveness, but if you make attractiveness the only thing, well now you've gone too far to the other side. There's, you have to stay in the middle, and you'll understand where I'm going when I get into the, when I get into the meat of this. But, but please understand that this is one of those areas, I'll go over this again and again, so that you don't get the idea that I'm standing up here saying that you can go sign somebody up to marry anybody they've never met before and it'll work. Because a lot of times it doesn't. There, there needs to be more than that in this sinful world in which we live, okay? Um, but it is true that Love is not the basis of marriage. It's a duty of the marriage. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. God tells husbands to love their wives. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, people will take that to mean, well, then he didn't love her before. Well... I don't know why he would have gotten married if he didn't, if there wasn't something there other than the fact that she belonged to the church. I mean, there's got to be something there, you would think. Um, in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, it says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. You see, you see how you could take this and go too far with it? And take it from the standpoint that you could take any two people that are, that are believers and stick them together and end up with a successful marriage? Some people will teach that. I don't agree with that. I think there has to be a little bit more than that. Um, now, I Another point that I need to make, and that is that love is primary, primarily 
behavioral. When we're talking about Christian marriage and Christian love, it is behavioral. It is not emotional. 2 John chapter 1 and verse 6. Love is a commandment. It is something that we are to do. It is something that we are told that we should... God tells husbands to love their wives. We've already looked at that verse. In, in uh, 2 John verse 6, it says, And this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. You see, it's a behavioral thing. It's not emotional. You choose to love someone. It is an act of the will. The question is not, do you love? The question is, will you? Are you willing to? When you meet this person, are you willing to love this person? Not, do you? There's, there are so many marriages that get started because of nothing more than a physical attractiveness to that particular person, and 50%, if not higher, end in divorce really quickly because folks that ain't love that is lust there's a difference just because you're attracted to somebody does not necessarily mean that you're going to love them you have a carnal nature within you that that has a drive within it that can lust after thing and something and make you think you're in love with it. And then as soon as that wanes, which it always will, well now all of a sudden you're not in love with them anymore. And it's as if you think you changed or something. You were never in love with them to begin with. Because you didn't understand what love was to start with. You were basing the decision strictly off of lust. Okay? So love is an act of will. Look, I want you to look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to notice that God didn't, he didn't die for us because we were attractive. He didn't die for us because we had some sort of wonderful quality that... No, we were sinners. He chose to love us. And that's what love is. You choose to love the person that you're married to. In 1 John 4.10, it says, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Turn to Genesis chapter 24. And you'll remember the story of, of Isaac, how that Abraham had sent his servant out to find a wife for Isaac. Um, and the servant did the job he was supposed to do and brought, and brought Rebekah back. And in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 67, it says, And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. You see, this was after the marriage. It was an act of will. It was something that he needed to do. Now, on a totally personal note, to try to give you an example, I loved Wendy before we were married, but I didn't love her then as much as I do now. It's like that old song, I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. That's how Christian love works. It works from the standpoint that you make the decision that, that, that you love someone enough to marry them, and then you continue because of, because of you grow together, because you, you have experiences together, you raise children together, you do things together, you live together, and as a result, you love them more and more and more and more. Now, I don't know that I can say that about her, relative to me, you know, I just got lucky on, on that respect. But, but that's, that's how Christian love is to work. Now this is not to say that emotional love plays no role in selecting a mate. It does. 
most certainly does. But you cannot, you cannot get to the point to where you hang on that entirely. You were in Genesis. Look, look at Genesis chapter 29 and verse 18 to make this point. Genesis 29, 18. You remember Jacob had, had uh, gone out to look for a wife and uh, the whole story with Laban, how he ended up with the wrong wife. But notice what he said about Rachel. In verse 18, Genesis 29, And Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve these seven years for Rachel, thy young daughter, your, thy younger daughter. You see, he, he loved her before. So it's not a case of, in every case, you can take two people that have never met each other and stick them together and it'll work. And it's not a case of, in every case, you have to have this emotional bond in order to make it work. It's in, it's in here somewhere. And most of the time, when you're absolutely head over heels for somebody, that burns out quickly. And when it burns out, there's nothing left. And that wasn't love to start with. That was lust. So. Remember that. That's one of the reasons that you'll find so many marriages, especially amongst your friends, for those of you that are a little bit younger, that, that end up ending in divorce because the people feel like, well, we just moved away from each other. or we, There wasn't enough there to hold it together to start with. And you never built on it. You, all you were doing was having the, the physical attraction and the and all of that and then once that kind of tended to wane and problems arose and things got rough well then you bail and leave and that's what's that's one of the problems that we have because people don't understand that it's it there's work involved if you're going to have a successful marriage you have to work at it you can't just expect it to all the chips to fall into place you've got to be willing to work at it Another point that we need to see, though, turn to Psalm chapter 37. On this point of the emotional part, Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The heart is the seat of desire. And the heart, we're told in Jeremiah 17, is 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 uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You have to be very careful if if you're just if it's just strictly emotion. There's got to be. We've had we had someone here in this church that was a founding member of the church that got involved strictly emotionally, had to have this woman threw God out the window to have her. We've seen that happen. We've seen it happen in other churches. We've seen it happen over and over again. So we have to be careful in, in, that, in that regard. How many have married based solely upon the heart's desire for the attractiveness of someone, only to find out that they're not even compatible? They should have never been together to start with. And it just ends up being a train wreck looking for a place to, to happen. As far as true love is concerned, it won't just happen. You won't just walk into the room one day and, and not have to lift a finger in order to have it. You've got to work at it. It's going to cost you something. You're going to have to give something up in order to have it. And it considers more than just itself. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the, this is the chapter on charity. And if we remember, the word charity means love. Though that's the point that Paul's trying to take, trying to make. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, referring to charity, it says, Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Now think of that in terms of your relationship with your wife or your husband or your intended wife or husband. Because that's incredibly important. True love considers more than itself. It considers it and its own feelings. It considers the other person's feelings. It considers how things are going to affect the object of that, of that love. If I do this, is it going to upset my wife? 
Is this something that's going to bother? Even though it's benign and it's not a sin and it doesn't really matter whether I leave the toilet seat up or not, is it going to upset my wife if I do it? You should think about that instead of just saying, well, the heck with it, I'm going to do it and, and leave it there. These are the kinds of little things that, believe it or not, divorces end up being caused over. Little stupid minor things that in reality wouldn't amount to anything at all, but can get blown out of proportion because neither party is looking out for the interest of the other party. They're only looking out for themselves. And love and charity does not seek a throne. It seeks the other. True love, and this is something else, is it's concerned with giving. Think about that verse in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son because he loved the world. It, love is concerned with giving, not getting. Ephesians 5, 25 says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. When you get involved in a relationship or if you're already there, ask not first, what can I get out of this? Ask, what can I give? Marriage is intended to where both parties are giving something. They're giving the best they've got to the other party so that the marriage will work. It's not all about, I get this and I get that. It's all about, what can I give you? What can I give to this to make it work, to help it work? And the first concern of love is not to be loved. It is to love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 John 4.10 Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 because I want you to see something. The very first mentioned characteristic of the perilous times towards the end in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now watch this. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And then it goes on, covetous, boasters, proud, blast. But notice, the very first characteristic is narcissism. That men shall be lovers of their own selves. That comes from the Greek word philotos, which means fond of self or selfish or lover of own self. Do you see how that is diametrically opposed to what we're teaching? The idea of being selfish means I'm not given anything. I want everything I can get out of this. And that's the opposite of how it should be. We're supposed to give to the relationship. Give until it hurts. And if the other party is giving back in return, the marriage will be successful. And if not, then it's headed for disaster. Now, I want you to, something else that I, I want you to understand, and that is that since all of us live with this sinful nature that we inherited from Adam, this idea of living for somebody else goes absolutely contrary to what our, our main intentions are. It's something that you have to think about. This isn't something that just that comes naturally. It does not come naturally to live for somebody else. It's something you have to work at. Because we are all sinners. Now, we have the ability to, to do better. If you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit within you that will help you to do better. But the, in, the, the first inclination is not to do this. It is, the first inclination is to do exactly the opposite and be selfish and get whatever I can get out of the relationship. But that's not going to make it work. The thing that will make it work is to do the opposite of what comes natural to you. Be like George Costanza in the, in the Seinfeld show when he 
discovered one time that every decision he had ever made was wrong and so he was going to start doing exactly the opposite of what he thought he should do and then had great success as a result of it. And so he would think, well, this is what I would normally do, so I'll do the opposite. And things were wonderful for him. So in your marriage, think George Costanza. And when you want to do something, think about it for a second before you open your mouth and think, maybe I should do the opposite. And it might just work. Or it might at least give you a good laugh. One of the reasons I looked at this, I looked at, the, at some of the statistics um, here in America. Marriages are, uh, I may have gone over this already with you, I might have brought it up last week, but what are we at? Over 50% divorce rate, second marriages are around 60 some percent, third marriages are over 70%, average marriage lasts I think eight point something years. Um, and you know what the biggest problem is? Selfishness. Now people will say that the biggest problem is financial. It's finances. But you know, you know why people get into financial trouble? Selfishness. They want that, they want that new car. They want that new house. And they don't care what they have to do in order to get it. That's what they want. They're selfish. And so they get it, and they put the family into financial straits. Well, then you start bickering over finances, but that wasn't, at the, that wasn't the core of the problem. The core of the problem was selfishness. And that's contrary to what we're taught. If spouses will invest in one another, turn to Matthew chapter 6. If spouses will invest in one another, then their heart which includes their thoughts and their will and their emotions will be in the relationship. Now I know this is a little out of context, but I'm going to read the verse anyway and show you how this could apply here. Because Christ says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is your spouse. Now remember, God first, spouse second as we're going to cover in, in the next section, I think. God first, spouse second. You don't do anything that your spouse tells you to do if it goes contrary to what God says. God comes first. Wives, you have a duty to, to be submissive to your husband, but that duty is only insofar as your husband is having you do things according to God's word. If he says, quit going to church, I don't want you to go there, or quit supporting the church because I don't want you to do it, or, or quit having anything to do with God and quit reading your Bible, you don't have to submit to that. It's only insofar as what he says that lines up with what God says. God comes first. Okay? But if your treasure on this earth is your spouse, then that's where your heart will be also. And it won't start drifting off into, into anything else. If both husband and wife choose to love each other according to the biblical definition of love, then they'll end up with a perfect bond and that marriage will work. It's just that simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Back to, that, to the chapter on charity again. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, or verses 4 through 7. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Do you see how with that in play, marriage will work? And if you're honest with yourself, you're going to, by reading those verses, you're going to realize how many times you stubbed your toe on every one of those. Daily. We all do it. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to do better. 
Paul said in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, or perfectness. Something else to consider, and that is that marriage is not an experience of perpetual infatuation and romantic ecstasy. It just isn't. Look at... Um, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 28. <clears throat> Paul, speaking of, of marriage, says, But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. There's trouble, but I spare you. You can't expect to get married and everything's going to be the prince and princess that sail off into never never land and and it was all nothing but happiness and birds chirping and flowers and kindness and sweetness no there's going to be trouble there is always going to be trouble and it and and think about it also from the standpoint that remembering that <clears throat> One of the things that Satan seeks to do is to destroy it. It's a given that there's going to be trouble. And the fact that, that you have this sinful nature that from time to time he can tweak, you know there's going to be trouble. So understand, there's, you know, one of the things I remember when, when I first got married, I, my parents, I never saw them fight. From the time I was a little kid, I never saw my dad raise his voice to my mother. I never saw my mother raise her voice to my dad. I never saw them fight. And so the first argument I got into, where it was one of those knock down, drag out, throw stuff at each other kind of argument, I thought that was it, I'm divorced. Marriage is over, I failed. You see, my parents would wait until the kids weren't around, and then when the kids weren't around, that's when they'd have their serious discussions. That's the way it should be. Kids should never see the parents arguing. You need to present a united front to the kids. And then when the kids are asleep, well, then you can go out and have it out when the kids aren't there to listen to you. But I had no idea that there was going to be trouble. I thought, well, if I get married, it's going to be just like it was with mom and dad. And they never fought, so we'll never fight. And 15 minutes into the marriage, you're fighting. Well, you know, that was a hard lesson to learn. So understand, it's not going to be all roses. Ecclesiastes 3, 5 says, A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Mere infatuation focuses on satisfying emotions that one's feeling. It's primarily selfish. That's what infatuation is. It's you wanting to satisfy your needs and your emotions, not the other way around. And since emotions change, emotions aren't adequate to define love. Married people don't always feel in love. It's at such times that, it's at those kind of times that true love will save a marriage. And some that marry on an emotional high thinking that that's what love is, end up being left with emptiness when that emotional high goes away. It's like a drug. You know, one of the problems that they have, that, that, that people have with drug addiction is that They'll take, they'll take some drug, like heroin, the first time, and it puts them on such a high. Well, then they drop off from that, and they try to get back up there again, but you can never get there again. You can never get back up to as high as you, as you were because your base point has dropped. And so what, you take it again, and, you're, and you, forever you're trying to get back, and pretty soon you get to the point to where you need the drug just to get to normal. And that's how people get addicted. Well, it's the same way with emotions. If you are seeking just the emotional high, that's going to wear off. And it's never going to be that strong again. And so 
you chase it and try, keep trying to get back to that emotional high again. And that creates a lot of problems and that's not how marriages work. Marriages should work. <clears throat> so marriage is not going to be free of trouble. Job said in Job chapter 14 and verse 1 that man is man that is born of a woman is full of days is a few days and full of trouble. So if you've got if everybody has trouble and then you put two people together, don't you think don't you see how it's going to be at least twice as much trouble? In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9, we see that marital companionship provides help in getting through the trouble. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. You see, that's why it's important that when you find a spouse, you find somebody that they have strengths where you're weak and where they're weak you have strengths so that when they fall you can lift them up and when you fall they can lift you up they have a good for if they fall one will lift up his fellow but woe to him that is alone when he falleth for he hath not another to help him up again if two lie together then they have heat but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and threefold cord is not quickly broken. I'm going to tell a little personal story. Now I'm going to get in trouble for this. But this morning, it was a little bit cold in the house. We didn't have the heater on. And I got out of bed earlier than Wendy did, and so she started yelling for the dogs, get up here, get up here. How can one be warm by yourself? You see? I know that's kind of an odd story to tell, but... And I'll pay for it later. <laughs> but just to illustrate the point. Hmm. First Corinthians chapter seven. We looked at this verse already. First Corinthians seven twenty eight. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if the virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Marriage brings its own set of troubles. There's a whole litany of problems that arise when you're married that you never run into when you're single. Those of you that are married know what I'm talking about. Those of you that aren't, well, you'll find out when you get there. I can't explain them to you. But anybody that expects a trouble-free marriage is setting themselves up for even more trouble. You, a good marriage is not one where neither party errs or troubles. We're human. We're fallen. We're gonna make mistakes. We're gonna do stupid stuff. And if I have not illustrated that this morning <laughs> by some of the things I've said, I don't know how better to do it then to just show you sometimes you're going to step on your tongue. Sometimes it's intentional, but you get the point. A good marriage is rather one where couples strive to minimize the troubles, but expect troubles. They work through them, they learn from them, and they don't let the troubles darken the heart and ruin the relationship. This is one of the reasons why it is so important that if you're going to marry, you marry someone that's equal with you relative to the church. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a whole nother set of trouble that you didn't bargain for. Think of it this way, a marriage is two imperfect and different people living as one. And that's going to cause conflict. That is just going to cause conflict. And marital conflict can be a useful tool in maintaining mutual respect and in enforcing accountability. One of the, one of the things that that's really important in a marriage is, and, and something that everyone needs to understand, and that is human nature is such that most people don't respect a pushover. Gentlemen, your wives are going to try you 
and they're going to test you to find out whether you're man enough to stand up to them or not. And you better be man enough to stand up to them. Because if you're not, and they can walk all over you, you've just given in and lost the whole game. That's a duty of the husband. Do not let the wife walk out. She will test you. Uh, trust me, she'll do it. You know, part of it too is because women have to live in a world that men don't have to live in. I maybe if you maybe if in my younger days if I hung around San Francisco, I might have to experience some of this stuff. But construction workers don't whistle at me when I walk down the street. You know. I don't get the cat calls that women get. I don't have to deal with that, but women do. And so when they're looking for a spouse, they want to make sure that that spouse is man enough to protect them from those guys out there that are whistling at them. And if you can't stand up to the wife, well, how are you going to stand up to those guys? Now, I don't have Bible for that. That's just a theory, but I think it holds true. And I know for a fact that women will test you. Don't fall down on the job. You are the husband. And, and they will not respect you if they, can just, if they can just walk all over the top of you. You've already lost the marriage. But being committed to make a marriage work, that'll give you a mindset to work through whatever those conflicts might be. If, you're, if your mind isn't there and you're not going to work on it, then it's just simply not going to work. Both parties have got to be in it 110%. And if both parties aren't in it 110%, it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to work. And it's not necessarily, marriage is not necessarily a relationship where all of one's needs are met by the spouse. I remember years ago, when, when we lived in California on Wednesday nights and sometimes on Saturday mornings, um, I would go on motorcycle rides. In fact, most, motor, most Saturdays I'd get up in the morning and ride down to the Harley dealer and hang out and play checkers and talk to the other guys and drink coffee and stuff. <clears throat> Wednesday nights we'd take off and ride out, ride out of the heat of the valley that we lived in, especially in the summer, just to go have dinner somewhere. Just a, a whole bunch of guys. Um, very rarely did Wendy go. That was one of the times that I was able to go away. But And, and some of the guys would even make the comment, we're surprised that Wendy will let you leave as, as often. Well, I'm with her 24 hours a day other than Wednesday night and Saturday morning. She's glad to see me out of the house. You know, there are times, and there's times when, when Wendy needs to be able to get away with friends and have some time to do things other than just being around looking at my ugly mug. You can't expect the spouse to provide 100% of everything that you need. That's just not going to work. That does not give you license to then spend five minutes with the wife and the rest of the time with somebody else. But it does explain some things. No, no single individual can supply every need of somebody else. It just can't be done. Except Christ, he can, but he's not here right now. So what we've got on this earth, not one single individual can do that. You, you, pick up, you pick up satisfaction from a lot of different, that's why some, you know, people, when you work your job, there are things that you'll pick up from your job that help supply some of those needs that your spouse couldn't help you with. There are things that we run into on a daily basis. It's not a sign of a bad marriage when each partner needs to have friends. That's not a sign of a bad marriage, not at all. A man can understand another man in ways that women can't, and vice versa. That's just a fact. Men, you're not going to understand women. And women, as shallow as we are, you're never going to understand men. Not the way men do. 
You know, David found a, found a love in Jonathan that he never found in a woman. Now that does not, that's not any kind of a untoward type of a love, but I have friends that I've known since I was in high school together that I'm still in contact with that that I have a love for that I could have for no one else. It's not the same type of love that I have for my wife. Well, think about your parents. Most of you loved your parents. That's different, right? I mean, it's a different type of a love. You can't expect a spouse to fill that void, to, to take care of all of that. What, what David found in First Samuel, or Second Samuel chapter 1 and verse 26, says, I'm distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan, very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. There are relationships that are very, very necessary because sometimes you can't fill all the needs that you need just from your spouse. But love for the Lord must take precedence over love for one's spouse or anyone else because he meets needs that no spouse can possibly need meet. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26 Luke 14, 26, says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. The love for God and love for Christ has to come first. Psalm 23 and verse 1, David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Christ is able to meet all of those needs where other people can't. And in Psalm 62, verse 5, <clears throat> David said, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. So what couples need to do is steer somewhere between the extremes of total dependence and total independence. Somewhere in the middle. And only you in your specific relationship know where the middle is. Make sense? A spouse who is emotionally needy and expects the other to fill every void is setting up the relationship for a failure. You can't expect any other human being on this planet to fulfill all of your needs for you. Because we're just incapable of doing it. So you need to be able to learn to resolve your emotional neediness through your relationship with God. <clears throat> because it's Jesus Christ who completes all of us and no other. John chapter 1 and verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received in grace for grace. It's his fullness that gives us what we need. Colossians 2.10 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Okay. The next section that we want to get into is this, and that is that mutual trust is essential to a healthy marriage, as it is to any other relationship. This requires that couples be truthful with each other. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Lying destroys trust. And trust is necessary for a healthy relationship. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, 
For they be all adulterers, assembly, an, an assembly of treacherous men. And they bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Take ye heed, every one his neighbor, and trust ye not in any brother. For every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanders, and they will deceive every one his neighbor, and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies, and weary themselves to commit iniquity. Thine habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will melt them and try them, for how shall I do for the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out, it speaketh deceit. One speaketh peacefully to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he layeth wait. Things had gotten so bad with the nation of Israel that God sent them into captivity because of this very issue. They were pretending. You can't pretend in a marriage relationship. Pretending is lying. And you can't lie in a marriage relationship and expect it to last. That will destroy it. Something else, and that this is going to be found in Song of Solomon chapter 8 and verse 6, where Solomon says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a, vo a most vehement flame. Marital, je marital love is jealous. It just simply is. And this heightens the need for trust. I can't tell you how many relationships I've seen over the years where someone's been hurt in the past and as a result they don't trust the present. This is something that I went through. I, I, I went through, you know, I went through a divorce early on because my first wife decided that she wanted to be with someone other than me. And that's a trust issue that when once that's broken it took many, many years before I was willing to even think about getting married again for fear that the same thing would happen all over again. And I can't tell you how many friends I have that are in that situation and to this day, even though they've been married for 15 years, they still don't trust their wife outside of their sight. You have to be able to trust your spouse if you don't, the marriage is dead. That's why it's so important that the trust is there. And so you don't want to do anything to break that trust. You never want, once you've broken that, it's, it's incredibly hard to get it back, if you ever can. On the other side, a man doesn't love his wife very deeply if he doesn't care if she has affairs. It's just that simple. Love is jealous. And if it doesn't bother you that your wife's out running around or your husband's out running around, if that doesn't bother you, then you're not, you don't love him. Sorry. Because love is jealous. It should drive you crazy. And adultery has a lasting reproach because of jealousy. In Proverbs chapter 6, in verse 32, Solomon says, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. 
adultery. That, in fact, God considers this and so respects jealousy in a marriage that in the case of adultery, he allows the innocent party to put away the guilty party and remarry without sin. That's serious of an issue. Matthew 19 and verse 9 says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her, which is putteth away, doth commit adultery. It's that serious of an issue with God. Now, while jealousy figures into a marriage, it should never spill over into mistrust when there's no cause for mistrust. That's another issue, and that's what I was talking about earlier. The idea where you don't trust someone when you don't have any reason not to trust them. They haven't given you reason not to trust them, but you don't trust them. I'll tell you what happens in those cases the person will end up, it'll end up being a self-fulfilled prophecy. If you accuse someone all the time of doing something that they're not doing, eventually they're going to do it. Because I'm going to take the blame anyway, damned if I do and damned if I don't. That's just human nature. So don't allow jealousy to ruin a marriage when the other party isn't doing anything to cause it when it's all within your, your own mind. Suspicion will take, make a good relationship impossible. You can't prove innocence to one who's determined to believe guilt. You just can't do it. And when suspicion rules, even silence becomes a crime. You know, and this has, you know, this goes farther than just marriage. Think about this when you're raising your children. Same thing applies. Same rules apply. If you don't have the proof, don't blame the kid. If you don't have the goods on him. Now, we have, we have, some, we have one couple here that only has one child and we have a couple of couples that have more than one child. Um, There used to be a comedy routine that said, you know, if you only have one kid, you're not really a parent because there's so many things that you have to deal with that, I mean, you know what, if something in the house gets broken, you know who did it. <laughs> you need two of them. You don't have any of the, he's touching me stuff going on in the back seat of the car. You miss out on all of that extra stuff that you have to have. So, so you need multiple children in order to really get the full flavor of being a parent. <laughs> but don't ever put something on them that they can't bear. And don't suspect them of something if you don't have any proof for it. If you got proof, then you got them. But if you don't, don't suspect them. And don't punish them for things that they didn't do, or and if you can't prove that they did it. see how long this next section is here. Well, I can get into it. Um, another, uh, the next point, and that is for an, in order for a marriage to work well, then forbearance and forgiveness have to be practiced. They have to be practiced. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Remember that, that you know, sometimes somebody will do something that will hurt your feelings and you, you get righteously indignant about it as if you've never done anything to hurt anybody else's feelings. And you know that's not true. Whatever they've done, you've probably did the same thing to somebody else, maybe not to them, but to somebody. And at the time that you did, you prayed that the, that, that other person would at least be forbearing and forgiving of you. So be forgiving of them. If, 
if you're married to the person, understand that unless they're doing something nefarious, unless it was malicious, forgive them and get, get on with it. Move on with your life. Forbear to means to bear with, to have patience with, to put up with, to tolerate. If you want to see forbearance, watch Wendy with me, because she has to forbear a lot. In Colossians 3 and verse 13, it says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. This isn't in my outline, but there's a verse over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, that says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Guys, if you got to spit up crow feathers to do it, apologize before the sun goes down. Wives, likewise. You're not going to sleep anyway. If you're in the middle of a fight, you're not going to sleep. You're going to toss and turn. You're not going to get any sleep anyway, so put an end to it and go to bed. Just go ahead and confess your problem and say you're sorry and make it right and then go to bed and go to sleep. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It's because you know, you know you'll just lay there and stare at the ceiling. You know that. So don't do it. Apologize and move on. And, and the other side of the, of the coin here, when they apologize, accept their apology, forbear, forgive, and don't expect your spouse to become everything you want him or her to be. One of the biggest problems that people have is they think that they can marry somebody and change them. You ain't gonna change them. Now over time they may change, they may mellow some, but what you're marrying is what you're marrying. Don't think you can turn that person into something else. They are what they are. And if you love them enough the way they are to marry them, then leave them alone and let them grow with you. you you're both imperfect sinners. There's some things you just have to bear with. There are just some things you have to put up with. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A couple should improve what they can. They should resolve what they can. They should negotiate what they can and tolerate what they must. Just that simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7 says, Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. What you can change, change. What you can't change, tolerate. And emotional health requires accepting that which cannot be changed. I say this all the time. I mentioned it this morning. Um, Pete Carroll, the football coach for the Seattle Seahawks, when he was at USC, he would teach the players his philosophy, and his philosophy was very simple. Um, don't worry about the things you can't control. If you can't control something, don't worry about it. Don't waste two minutes on it. If you don't have control, I don't have control over what President Barack Obama <laughs> does today. I have absolutely no control over him. So I don't worry about it. I worry about the things that I can control, which aren't really a lot. I can control my reaction to what people do and I can control how I live. And that's it. That's all I can control. Worry about that. Worry about taking care of your family. Worry about the things that you're supposed to do and don't worry about the rest of it. You know, we live in a we live in a in, in in an area or in an era where there are so many distractions out there to keep us from concentrating on what we should do. And we run around in circles messing around with a bunch of stuff that we can't control anyway. 
getting all worried and all frustrated over the pol political scene and all this other stuff that's out there that we have absolutely no control over whatsoever. None. I can't control who the, the Republicans nominate for president. I can't control who the Democrats nominate for president. I can't control who wins the race in November. So does it really make that much sense for me to sit here and worry about it? Wouldn't my time be better spent worrying about what I can control, worrying about the things that I can do? And that's what we need to remember. And that will make you healthier emotionally when you don't get so involved and so worked up over stuff that you don't have any control over anyway. You can't do anything about it. So concentrate on the things that you can do. Now on another note though, be wary that this expectation of forbearance from your spouse does not become an excuse to not make a change. Does that make sense? You see, if you know that your spouse is just going to forgive you anyway, don't think that you can just go run roughshod over the top of them because they're going to forgive you so I can go, but that's, now you're sinning. Now you're getting into an area that you shouldn't be. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5 says, Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Another point is that when you do sin against your spouse, notice I didn't say if, when, when you do sin against your spouse, then take responsibility for it. And if you've injured the marriage, then take responsibility for it. Don't resort to shifting the blame, throwing somebody else underneath the bus. Genesis chapter 3, I want you to see, I want you to see this. This is, this is really interesting, I think. Genesis chapter 3. This will show you where this comes from. And we see it in the world all the time. And so, for God's children, learn not to be like the world in this area. Because we see it constantly. Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. This is right after the fall. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Look at that. He throws his wife right underneath the bus. Right? God asked him, why do you do it? Well, because her. It's her fault. Blame her. She did. And then look at this. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She throws the devil under the bus. That's natural, folks. That's the normal response when somebody approaches you about something that you did wrong. The normal, automatic, sinful response is to blame somebody else. If it's your fault, confess it and get it over with. If you screwed up, say, you know what? I screwed up. Sorry. Because You've already seen where this comes from. And, and, and now, now watch it. Over the course of the week, watch some of this stuff. Um, you'll see it in the news all the time where one, one person will blame somebody else for something that happened. It's constant. And that's a normal response. Don't follow the normal response, especially when it comes to your marriage. In John chapter 9 and verse 34, This is, the, this is a case where the, the little man had been born blind, and he's starting, to, he's starting to teach these Pharisees. He's starting to get into a conversation because they're attacking him because he, he's not sure who it was that made him see. He'd been cured of his blindness. And they, 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 in, in John 9, 34, it says, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. You see, don't counter-accuse somebody else. If, if someone comes to you because you did something, don't throw something back in their face. As if, well, you did this to me. So that, as if that justifies what you did. Because it doesn't. Don't do that. Just confess it. 
you're responsible to do what's right regardless of what your spouse does. And when your spouse sins against you and doesn't repent, this is important, before you conclude indifference or malice or hard-heartedness, you got to ask yourself some questions. Okay? This is important. Was it really a sin? Or is it just a matter of your perception of the issue? Did they really sin against you? Did they really do something to harm the relationship? Sometimes one's own insecurities will color things darkly in an, so that an otherwise innocuous word or deed, um, the spouse will say something or do something not intending anything by it whatsoever and it'll be misunderstood by the other spouse and that'll start a war. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, it says, Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Make sure that it's a camel that you're dealing with and not a gnat. Make sure, before you launch into an attack, make sure that there's really something there to launch into. Being thin-skinned and taking umbrage at every little thing that comes along is contrary to charity. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, is not easily provoked. So just because your spouse might do something that you think is, is untoward, or that they've done something to hurt your, they, they may not have even intended to. They may not even realize that they've done it. Something else, if, if you have a history of holding your spouse to such a high standard of flawlessness that he or she no longer knows how to please you, they'll get to the point where they don't care. And again, this applies to children. If you set the bar so high that there's no way in the world that they can ever get there, you will not end up with a good relationship. Not every, not every child is going to grow up to get a PhD from a university and become, or become a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist or a anything. Not all of them are going to do that. Not all of them are going to be football stars. Not all of them are going to be on television. The, most people are just people. Don't expect more out of them than they have. And don't set the bar so high that they think that if I don't reach this bar, my mom or my dad don't love me. Don't do that to your kids, ever. And don't do it to your spouse. Don't set the bar up here somewhere when you know that the best they can do on, their, on the best day that they've got is here. And you've got the bar set up here. Because what will happen is they'll eventually give up. They'll get to the point to where, well, there's no way that I can reach that. If I do the best I can do, I can't reach that. And they'll quit caring. And they'll quit working towards a relationship. And they'll just give up. You know, in Galatians 3.10, Paul says, For as many as are of the law, or, or uh, as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Moses' law demanded absolute perfection. If you erred in one area, you were guilty of the entire law. That's what Moses' law demanded. And in Acts chapter 15 and verse 10, <clears throat> Acts 15, 10 says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Don't instill 
such a strict expectation of perfection from your spouse to the point that they can't bear it and there's no way they can get there. They will eventually give up. And something else that you need to understand is, does he or she even know that you were offended? I fall into this one a lot. I'll say something and I'll upset somebody and I don't even know that I've said it. I don't even know that I offended him. I have no idea. And some of you have probably been in the same situation. You've said something off the cuff and somebody gets offended at you and you don't even know that you did it. You don't even realize it. Sometimes spouses have no idea that they've done something that's considered offensive and how in the world can you expect somebody to repent of something that they don't know they're guilty of? And so somebody does something to upset you and then they don't repent and you get mad at them and they don't even know. There's, have you addressed the spouse? Have you gone to them and told them? First, to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 again, verse 4. It says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. When you go to your spouse on one of these, don't go, don't walk in the door with a finger in the nose yelling and screaming. Go in there lovingly, go in kindly, ask, don't demand, and find out if they even know, if they even realize that whatever it was that they did that offended you caused offense. There's a good chance they don't even realize it. Then you could end up in a war over something that the other party doesn't even know that, they don't even know why. On the other hand, when your spouse sins against you and repents, then forgive them. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 through 4. Luke 17, 3 through 4. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And when you forgive them, truly forgive them from the heart. Matthew 18.35 says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Really forgive them. Don't just say you forgive them and then next week bring it up again. And then three months later bring it up again. And then for the rest of their lives bring it up again because you haven't really forgiven them at that point. Don't bring it up again. If your spouse does something wrong and repents of it, then that's it. Forgive them and don't bring it up again. Let it go. And don't bring it up to others. Don't go spread it around. And don't bring it up to yourself because that'll just make you brood over it. Forgive from the heart and let it go. Be willing to forgive a wrong more than once. Matthew 18 verse 21 says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Even if they do it over and over again. You know, sometimes it takes a while for people to get the point. But if they're willing to, to apologize for it, accept the apology and work towards getting it better. Okay, I've got one more I'm going to finish up with real quick. Three, only three verses we're going to look at. But I want to go ahead and wrap this up. I'm, I may be running a little longer than normal, but I want to get this done this week. 
there's three ways of dealing with conflict. Now this does not just apply to marriage. This applies to conflict in general. But it is, but, but in this context we're talking about marriage. Three ways to deal with it. When you have conflict in a marriage, there are three ways to deal with it. Number one, you can confront the person and force the issue. That's one thing you can do. You can not force the issue and bear a grudge. That resolves absolutely nothing. So you can force the issue and that might, that might, it might work out or it might blow up. One way or the other. You can not force it and bear a grudge for the rest of your life, in which case all that does is give you an ulcer. Or you cannot make an issue over it and put it behind you. This is the same way that it is in the church. If a brother offends you, we have steps that you take. You go through Matthew 18 and you follow the steps. I've taught you that before. Or let it go. If it's not that big of a deal, let it go. Get it over with. In Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 11, it says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Sometimes if it's not that big of a deal, just, let, just forget about it. And get on with your life and let it go. It's good to overlook another's faults when it's reasonable to do so. Unloading on your spouse for every little fault just simply sends a message that it's absolutely impossible for him or her to ever measure up to your, expect, up your expectations. That's all it does. If you harp on them all the time, all it does is send a message that they're never going to be able to get there. And it's the same with children. If all you do is harp on them all the time, over and over and over and over again, it sends a message that no matter what I do, I can never measure up to, to, to this. I can't get there. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 33 says, Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the ringing of the no nose bringeth forth blood, so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. So unloading on them, just understand that if you do it too often, you're going you're gonna to get back to the situation where they feel that, I can't measure up, so why should I even try anymore? Now there is, there is a time, though, when faults can't be passed over. Depending on how severe it is, there are times when it can't be passed over. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. When you have to deal with these issues, you do not deal with them to the point that it causes hatred with them. You see, sometimes if you don't deal with it and it causes a grudge, then, then you, you're in a worse say, case than you were if you dealt with it. So when you have to avenge a wrong, don't bear a grudge against the person. Deal with the wrong, get the behavior out of the way, don't go after the person. Does that, does that make sense? Because it's the behavior of the person that you're, that you're going against, not the person themselves. It's, it's their behavior. If, if, if one of your children is doing something that they shouldn't do, you stop the behavior. You don't, you don't kill the child. You don't start hating the kid because he did something that you didn't want him to do. It's the behavior you try to correct. Okay. So with that, I've, I've, I've gone far enough this morning. In fact, I've probably run over time-wise, but um, I'm going to wrap this up for today, and then we'll come back in next week, Lord willing, and, and get, into a, get into another section. Um, 
and then probably we'll probably have next week and then depending on how far we get we might take a break for a couple of weeks um, at least from from this topic so with that I thank you for your kind and patient attention this morning let's uh, stand and be dismissed in prayer